need to give him a couple more minutes. What? Probably need to give him a couple more minutes. Good morning. If you have an empty spot, like in the middle, if you guys could kind of move in, we got a few people still looking for seats. And while we do that, if you guys could please stand with me this morning. morning. Um, if you guys will bow your heads, we're just going to open up in a word of prayer to our Heavenly Father this morning. Lord, we just thank you for the privilege that it is to be other to, to be able to gather here, Lord, as your people. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you bestowed upon us, that Father has allowed us to have this place to meet, and Father, uh, to be here this morning. And Father, we want to give it to you, Lord. It can be something made by human hands, and Father, it won't mean anything at all. So Lord, we just lay it down this morning, and Father, we ask that you would guide us. Father, I ask that you would guide um, our thoughts here this morning. I ask that you would guide uh, the teachings that are done this morning, Lord, the songs that are sung, Lord, uh, to declare your goodness and your greatness, Lord, and uh, 
Father, we just ask for your, your guiding hand upon us here this morning. Father, I thank you for each and every soul that has come here, Father. We are called, Lord, it's not an accident. We are called here, Father. We're called here to worship you this morning and to fellowship. Father, help us to do that. Lord, just lead us and guide us, direct our hearts this morning um, before you, Lord. We just love you and we thank you and we ask it in Jesus' name.
something special going on this morning. Good morning. This is an exciting day. It's always an exciting day whenever we have, I'm drying my hand off because I stuck my hand in the water and forgot that I was going to hold the microphone for a second. And so I'm trying to, you know. Um, we got a couple of uh, young students and I tell you that this, the stories are just pretty incredible. Um, and so I'm going to have, let me hold this thing here. I got a little stool over here. Come here. Why don't you come over here? I got you. One more step. One more step. There you go. Oh, there we go. So this is Everly. And Everly, why are we getting baptized today? So two students, two incredibly different stories, but the incredible thing of what God's done in their heart. Everly, Everly was on her way to uh, cheerleading practice. Uh, the other day and was asking her dad, Andrew, said, hey, you know, tonight when we have our family prayers, I want to ask Jesus into my heart. And so they started asking questions. And so while all this is going on, um, you know, they're at the home, the family's all around them, and they got to do this like experience just as a family. And so I think that's like the most incredible thing ever. And we're so thankful for uh, the role of, of Andrew and Heather and, and Ian and Graham and Knox and their family and their extended family who's all up here in the front this morning, and so we're excited today to be able to, to baptize Miss Everly, so I'm going to set this thing down, and hopefully you guys can hear me. Everly? <laughs> Upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, my privilege today to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You thought I'd remember to tell. So this little guy, this one's special. <clears throat> so the other day he walks in, and he, he's back talking to his mom, which isn't unusual. And so we, he comes walking out, and I said, what's going on, buddy? And he goes, ah, you know. He just kind of hymns and haws, and he goes into his room, and he comes back out, and he hands me a note. And on that note, it says, I asked Jesus into my heart. <laughs> and I go, well, when did you do this? And he's like, oh, you know, last night I was in bed, and I wasn't really sleeping. And he said, I just, you know, I said, I just knew I needed to ask Jesus into my heart. And so I'm like, so of course, I'm like, well, what did you say, and how did you say it? And what did you, you know, you're just kind of going through and man, he just, same thing with Everly, like they just, they knew, like these students just know, and so like I'm excited because this is just a great, like to see kids uh, come to faith in Christ, to see their family serving God together, like that to me is, is the most incredible thing, and so I'm, this one's a special one for me, all of them are special, but you know, this is, uh, for those of you who don't know me, this is my son, and uh, sorry, I should have maybe uh, just mentioned that earlier, but um, anyway, we appreciate your guys' investment in our family and in, in the other families that you've seen, the Noltings and the other families, because you guys have a part of this too, and so we just appreciate all that you guys do. So Eric, today, why are we getting baptized? I asked Jesus in my heart. I asked Jesus in my heart. Okay. All right, buddy.
is it on? Yes. Good morning, Lebanon First Church. What a great way to just start our Sunday morning, just being able to see baptisms. That's just such an enjoy and encouragement to be able to watch our students <laughs> just live for Christ. But we're so glad you're here this morning and that you're here with us. We got another packed house this morning, which is so awesome to see all of our seats filled up, which it should be every Sunday. But uh, we're just so glad you're here. And if you're new with us, we just thank you for being here. Um, and if you have any questions, get out in the foyer at the end of service. We'll have people out there that you can talk to. And we also have connection cards in the front, which you can put those in the offering plate as it comes around this morning as well, too. But for some announcements this week, today we're taking up a love offering. And, and that is uh, it's a unique opportunity for us to give and support a Ukrainian refugee family um, who's currently living in Lebanon. And so that's an awesome opportunity there for that. And then also tonight, we have 40 or more pickleball tonight, 6 to 8 in the Can Do Center. And then we have the foundation tonight, which is our college-age ministry, and that's been going awesome. It's also open to juniors and seniors as well, too, but we've been able to just really dive in and unpack some scripture, and, and the community there is awesome. And so if you know anybody that is interested in that, send them to me. And then on Wednesday night, we have Wednesday night meal and Bible study. And we're going to have some lasagna, salad, bread, and green beans, and chocolate dessert this week. And that starts at 5.30 for food. And so please sign up online or in the foyer. And then if you don't want food, uh, student ministries and service and Bible study starts at 6.30. And then we also have our senior ministries trip coming up. That is April 28th to Dogwood Canyon in Branson. And then we also have the Bountiful Outdoor Spring Shootout, which is April 30th. And that is 10 to 2 at Osage Fork Conservation Area. And then some more upcoming events. We have a drop-off baby shower. That is May 1st, and that is for Brad and Alyssa and baby Presley that's getting ready to come. And so make sure to bring them some diapers and, and some wipes and supplies for them and support them. And then we have our, our Joy Women's Luncheon, which is May 7th, 11.30 a.m. in the Can Do Center. And Karen Dye is the speaker for that, and there will be food. There will be a taco bar there, too, and so make sure that you just have that noted, and you can sign up online or in the foyer for that as well, too. And then we have a teen activity coming up. They are going to Jets Trampoline Park May 13th. Um, more info on that is going to be coming soon. And then we also have our welcome table for the Smiths for Layton and his, and his family coming in. Uh, it's kind of going to kind of be like a, a drop-off shower, and we will set up a table in the foyer May 15th uh, for his family. And then it, you can look in the bulletin, and it says, please consider bringing a new grocery item or home essential item for their pantry as they relocate to Lebanon and, and join our First Church family. And so make sure that we are uh, providing for them, supporting them as they're going to come in here and do ministry and, and, and do it well, too. And then also... We have camp coming up soon. Camp's getting ready to come up. School's about to be over. Camps are awesome. Camp is an amazing time for our students. And so teen camp, we, we got pre-registration deadlines. The teen, teen camp is May 23rd, and, and camp is June 13th through the 17th. And then preteens must be signed up by June 13th, and that camp is June 27th through July 1st. But at this time, we're done with announcements, and we're going to have our tithes and offerings this morning. So if our ushers will please come forward. We also have a text to give option two. Um, you can text that number. Perhaps it will pop up there maybe. And that's a super easy way to give as well too. Luke, will you pray for us this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you so much um, for this time that we get to just set aside to uh, focus on nothing but you, God. Um, God, to reflect on, God, how gracious you are, how, how merciful you are, God, to celebrate in the, in the baptisms, God. We know that you are doing some amazing things in this church. And God, I just ask that um, we view this time as as a time of worship just like any other part of the service that we thank you for the things that you have done and, and trust that um, the 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 tithes and offerings that we are giving to you god you can do more than that than what we can and so god i just ask that uh, um, we would follow you we would give cheerfully 
and um, just thank you for all the things that you've done because everything that is good comes from you and it's in your name we pray amen everyone and please stand with me we're going to dismiss our students to head downstairs if you are fifth grade or younger you are dismissed downstairs for children's church at this time
be seated this morning. Amen. Well, good morning. I'm hot. I don't know, is that bath water in there or what the deal was? Man, what an exciting day. I love, love, love. To me, there's no better way uh, to begin a service than with baptisms. And, you know, I was laying in bed last night and I was thinking, you know, about uh, Everly and about uh, Eric and about the students that we've baptized over the years. And uh, I'm going to be honest with you, like, I love baptizing kids, but I just love baptizing people. Uh, I love what that stands for. I love what it means that it is an outward profession of that inward decision that we've made to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And I love that, that you know, that in Eric, you know, I, I, him, because I've talked to him a lot, and he'd be like, Dad, I want to get baptized. I want to get baptized. I said, well, son, there's something really needs to take place before we get to the baptism stage. But I, I, what I love about it is that these kids have sat in church for, you know, most of our students, for most of their lives. And they've watched student after student uh, that has come before them through the ministry of the church. They've watched many of you as adults go up in the baptistry and be baptized. That was something that meant something to these students. All because of the witness and the testimony of the people who have come before them. And we've really been in a series the last two or three weeks called Asking for a Friend. You know, those questions that have a tendency to pop into our heads that maybe we're asking, but we're afraid to ask out loud. And I think one of them, if I was going to continue this series on a little bit longer, the next question I would ask was, would be this, can God use me? Can God use me? And the reality is he's using you whether you realize it or not. Now, to what extent he's able to use you, um, maybe another question to ask. But for many of you, he, he has used you with these young students, whether they're 18 or 15 or 7 or 2. They've seen the love that you've poured out on our students. They've seen the way that you've loved them and served them. And so I want to encourage you. Uh, we've got enough kids that you probably don't know every name. But I tell you, it means something to them if you just walk up to them and introduce yourself and say, hey, is there some way, some specific way this week that I can be praying for you as you go to school and as, you, as you're, you know, in, or, you know, in your, in your uh, after school activity? How can I be praying for you this week? And I want you to know that there's somebody praying for you. Um, and so uh, anyway, I, I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for your impact, not only in my family, but as I've got to watch over the last um, 12 and a half years of your impact in the lives of other people. And so it's just a fantastic thing. If you have your Bibles, read the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to kind of wrap up. Last week we asked the question, um, you know, kind of what difference does Easter make? Um, you know, again, asking for a friend. We know the resurrection of Jesus. Maybe the reality is we're asking the question, like, what's the significance of it? I know we celebrate it. I know it's a part of our faith, but why does it really matter? And last week we asked the question, like, what does the resurrection mean? Uh, and, and we talked about it meaning three things. One, that Jesus is who he says he is. When we read in the scripture in the Gospel of John and we read about what the apostles write in the letters that they wrote to the New Testament church, we find that every, because of the resurrection, everything that Jesus claimed about himself is indeed true. We also learn that Jesus has the power that he said that he had. He said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. I'm going to take it back up again. And he does exactly what he says. He tells the disciples several times leading up to his crucifixion that the Son of Man is going to be delivered over to sinful men. He's going to be crucified. And on the third day, he's going to rise. And then he, in fact, does it. And then the third thing we talked about was when God makes a promise, he's going to do what he claimed he, 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 was, he said he was going to do. If he makes a promise... He's going to do it. And he promised he would rise from the dead. He did it. Uh, and we're going to read today in another passage, uh, like how, you know, the, the, that it was a witness thing. It wasn't a secret that he rose from the dead. It wasn't a, uh, you know, the, the, the Jerusalem knew it. The Roman Empire would soon learn about it. He revealed himself to people over and over again uh, throughout the, his remaining time on the earth before he ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1. Like we know that it happened. But for us today, why does the resurrection matter? Like, we know what the resurrection means now, but why does it matter in our 
life? Why, why do we hold this day that we celebrate, like to me, probably one of the most holy days of the year, this day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead? So if you have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is where we're going to be reading at today. And, and so Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, to this group of believers, and the first part of the Bible is kind of the first part of this book. There's, a, there's some reprimand, there's some correction, some teaching that takes place. And he talks about in verse 3, he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. And he says that for a reason. These are people that you can go talk to that that witnessed Jesus having been resurrected from the dead. And he said, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. And then he goes down in verse 12, and he says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead. Now, let me set the, some context here. There was some, some argument with some religious groups of the day that there was no resurrection of the dead. Like the, re- the dead were not going to be raised. And so Paul begins this kind of rhetorical argument, like, where, you know, well, if they're not, then this. And then he makes a statement, he begins to change, shift gears a little bit. He says, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, and, and he doesn't say this, but and he has appeared to all these people, it is witnessed, it is testified about that Jesus has raised from the dead. He says, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And he says, your faith is in vain. If Jesus hasn't raised from the dead, then all we proclaim, all we believe, everything is in vain. He says, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. He says in verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So there's no hope. It says in verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, he says, we are of all people most to be pitied. Now you leave it there and there's almost this somber tone, but then you get to verse 20. And he says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we celebrate you this morning. We celebrate your resurrection. We thank you when we celebrate your atoning death on the cross. We celebrate for the new life that that death brings to us and makes available to us through your death, burial, and resurrection. God, we thank you for the new life that has been found by these two students today, Eric and Everly. God, we ask your blessings on them, and God, that you would continue to lead them. God, I thank you for those who have surrendered their life to you and received you as Lord and Savior of their life, that they get to testify, God, that you are who you say you are, that you uh, have the power that you've claimed to have, that your word is true, God, that when you make a promise... When you say that you will make us a new creation, that the old is gone and the new has come, God, that we testify to the certainty of it, that God, nobody can change our mind about who you are and what you've done and and what you have done in our hearts and in our lives. And God, I pray that for your church today, that we may be bold, that God, we would not stand back and just kind of keep this as a hidden secret, that it would not be something that we would be ashamed of. But God, we would testify and proclaim the greatness of who you are, what you have done in our life, what we have witnessed you doing in the lives of other people. God, we thank you for the way that you have healed. We thank you for the way that you have transformed. We thank you for the way that you have breathed life into things that were once dead. And God, we thank you for the hope that we have in you. And so Father, today as we unpack a little bit about why your resurrection matters, Lord, I pray that we might be reminded this morning 
of the sins that have been forgiven us. Lord, I pray that we be reminded today of the power that is made available to us through your son, Jesus, that we would know his power, that we would know his truth, and God, that, I, that our, our, our present would be, would be blessed. God, I pray that we would be reminded of the hope that you have secured for us one day in heaven. Because, Lord, this world is not all there is that you have prepared a place for us. And so, God, I pray that you'd open our minds and open our hearts. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to us today. We ask all these things in the mighty and awesome name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Why does the resurrection matter? Number one is this, the resurrection matters because it means that your sins, your past, has been forgiven. As a matter of fact, Paul makes this comment, he says, listen, if, if, if Christ is not raised, then we're still in our faith is futile and we're still in our sin. Like our sins has not been forgiven. You know, that's great news that our, our sins can be forgiven because how many of us you know, have things in our life that we wish we could go back and we wish we could do over again? Things maybe we said that we wish would have never left our lips. Something that we did that we look back on and we wish we'd never done that. Those regrets and those things that we wish we could go back to change is a little way that God has imprinted in our hearts and in our lives and in our minds this need that we have for repentance. For the old to be taken away, for the past to be, to, to be uh, redeemed, and for us to be able to walk in some frame of newness of life in Him. And sometimes we wish we could just start over. Like we wish we could just have the slate, the old etch-a-sketches when we were kids, those of us that remember what those are. You know, you mess something up, you give that thing a shake, and bam, you know, that thing would disappear, and you'd be able to go back and start all over again. And it leaves us feeling, you know, this, these regrets and the guilt and the shame, and all that leaves us feeling like we have no hope or no future. We feel like we're going to spend the rest of our lives in this penalty box of our own creation with, with no hope of ever getting out. But the Bible declares to us a completely different message. Now, Satan wants us to be trapped in this penalty box, in this prison of our own making, that I don't deserve to get out of it, that I don't deserve forgiveness, or I don't deserve for my life to be any better than what it is. But the reality is Jesus says, and in John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, he says, listen, for God so loved the world, so we need to understand, first off, that you are loved today. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. You are just simply and purely loved in a way that you could never imagine. But he says, you, he loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. That's why the resurrection matters. That whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And he says, for Jesus came into the world. And you got to get this. But Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. That's what, the, that's what the world wants us to believe about Jesus. That he came just to condemn us and tell us how bad we were and how rotten we are and how dirty, rotten sinners. But he says he didn't come to condemn us. He came that we could have life in him. We came to save us. Amen. Because see, apart from him, we don't have any hope. We don't have hope of our, forgiveness, our sins being forgiven. We don't have hope of a present that means anything or a future that's secure for us. We don't have any kind of hope. But in Christ, hope springs eternal. And what the Bible tells us is, is that all this is possible. The forgiveness of sins is possible because of what Jesus has done. Colossians chapter 2 says, He canceled the record of charges against us and took it away. How? By nailing it to the cross. That he, and he tells the disciples over again, I, gotta, I have to die. I have to. Like It's got to happen. Why? Because our sins are forgiven through the nailing it to the cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. What does this mean that he takes our sin and nails it to the cross? Paul elaborates. He says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. A new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift of God who brought us back to himself through Christ and so then, it, but it doesn't stop there. Like it doesn't just stop with you and I receiving Jesus. He says, then he says, and God has given us this task of reconciling others to him. That's ministry. That's us doing what's necessary in the lives of other people in order to bring them and reconcile them in their relationship with Christ. 
So I can use golf to the glory of God. I can use uh, knitting to the glory of God. I can use my kids' summer t-ball or basketball or football team. I can use those things to the glory of God because those are avenues that God has given me to be able to reconcile people to Jesus, to just make the introduction But the resurrection matters because it means our past, our sins, have been forgiven. Jesus can forgive your sins. We need to understand that. But number, I would also say this. Not only does Jesus, can Jesus forgive your sins, but he wants to forgive your sins. Like There's a big difference between someone being able to do something and someone wanting to do something. We know a lot of people who can do stuff but don't want to do stuff. But Jesus not only can, he wants to. He desires and he pursues us so that he can do that. Sometimes that feels like in a church service. We don't know what that feels like sometimes, but it's like when God, like your heart starts, like something happened in here, and we're like, man, like it's hot in here, right? Kind of get a little sweaty, and like uh, our heart kind of starts maybe pounding a little bit. And we think, well, I just got to get out of here. Like I'm in a big group of people, or I, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, what, we, we start, but man, that may be the conviction of the Holy Spirit that's just dealing with our heart. That what this joker up here in the pulpit saying may there may there's something to it. Like this isn't just something that we came up with. That the scriptures are true, that Jesus is who he says he is, and that means for us that our sins and our past can be forgiven. And for the briefest of moments, sometimes hope springs up inside of us. But we've got to realize that there's an enemy, and at the same time that that enemy is going, but that hope isn't for you, buddy. But listen, you got to quench that you got to say that hope is for me because Jesus died for me and for my sins. And that's the truth of the scripture. That anyone who calls on his name can and will be saved. That's his promise to us. And that's what that means. So our past can be forgiven. But not only that, my present can flourish. So what does the rise of resurrection matter? It matters because my sins can be forgiven. But my present is not all that I know it to be. That it can flourish. I think many of us, man, we're just striving for survival. Am I right? Hey, I ask you how you, how's things going in life? Oh, it's busy, right? Like you're afraid to take on one more thing because that's going to be the one thing that capsizes the boat because you've already got it overloaded and then you're afraid you're going to drown in it and you're not going to see a way to the end and you're not going to know what to do. And all of a sudden you're thinking about this and your heart's beating, your pits are sweating, your palms are sweating, and you don't know, 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 right? We get that way. We're surviving. That's all we're doing. Doing our best to keep the waters at bay. We're like the disciples in the boat when the waters rage and they're grabbing buckets and it, it, it's filling up faster than we can chuck. That's what we feel like often in life. But Jesus did not die and rise from the dead so that we could merely survive this life with hope of the next. There is hope that we can flourish today. People feel hopeless. They feel powerless to change their lives. They feel powerless to break a bad habit. They feel powerless to save a relationship. And what you need to do is quit trying to do it all in your own power and find a power that's greater. Guess what? The Bible talks about that. Huh. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Paul says this, I pray, I also pray, that you will understand. Is this up there? Oh, yeah. I also pray that you will understand the what? Say it with me. The incredible greatness of what? Of your power? Of God's power. For us who believe him. So Paul's declaring that there is a power made available to you and I. That there's a power available to us for those who believe in him. And he says this is the same mighty power. So this isn't a different power. This isn't a watered down power. This isn't a, 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 a diluted power. He said it's the same mighty power, in verse 20, that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. So the same power that enabled Jesus to rise from the dead, guess what? That same power is available in the life of a believer. Now, church, let me ask you a question. How many of us actively attempt to tap into that power? Can I be honest with you? Here's what I do. I'm a battery, and I plug in just long enough to turn on. And then I'm like, oh, I got 2% battery. Doink! 
I unplug, and then I go run and try to do something. That's doing life in my own power. I give me just enough. Give me just enough. The Bible tells us that it is out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. It's out of the overflow of the heart that we're able to serve and do ministry. And guess what? If I'm only running on 1% or 2%, those of you that got smartphones, how long does that give you a Facebook scrolling? Some of you may be finding out right now. But it doesn't give us much. We can't accomplish much. But what we have to do is we have to tap in and we have to understand that you and I, we are, there's a very real illustration here. From, from an emotional standpoint, from a psychological standpoint, from, from emotional health, mental health, you and I are, are, are batteries. But we are not quickly recharged batteries. We're like, we need to be on a trickle charger, okay? It is a process. Once those batteries get ran down, we start running on something called adrenaline, It's not what we were intended to to run on. That's what we were intended to be fueled by, adrenaline. Most of us are like that. Deadlines get here, and all of a sudden we like, and we're like, well, I work best under pressure. No, you don't. You become addicted to adrenaline, and that's not the way God created you to work. Like, it's just, it's the facts. What we need to do is plug into his power, and we need to give ourselves rest. We need to give ourselves time for those batteries to recharge. We need to be plugging into the right things that energize us and restore us. This type of setting, the scriptures, time in prayer, time dwelling and thinking about, you can grab a discipleship guide on your way out the door this morning, and that would be another way to help us charge our spiritual batteries. But we need that. We need to plug into this power because all we're doing is surviving when Jesus, and Paul says it, he says, listen, if, if, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we're of all people, but most of us don't have hope in this life. Like, all we're trying to do is to get to the next thing, and the next thing, if I can just get, I'm, I, listen, I said it the other day to somebody. I said, boy, if I could just get to whatever it was. I don't want to wish my life away, but how many of us do that? This season is so stressful, if I can just get past. We're not created to do that. And I'll be honest with you. I, I, I watched a little girl sitting right here. I think it was some of you, Heather's family. And man, that song, that music was playing. And she was up there, I, I swear, if mama hadn't been, she'd have been up here on stage next to Melissa. And it would have been awesome. You want to know why? Because sometimes Jesus says, yeah, I have faith like a child. And if we're not careful, we, be, we get old and grumpy. I don't care if you're 25 or 85. It's a danger for us all that we just sit back and we quit standing in awe of who God is. And we quit tapping into the power. And the music comes on, we're like, Blessed be your name. In the world. <laughs> but church, listen, it's all right to raise our hands once in a while. It's okay to clap. It's okay to get a little boogie. You don't want me boogieing, but it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to let some of that out instead of just being like, Ugh. we got to let some of it out. Because you know what, for some of us, that's a way that our batteries are recharged. That's a way that we get that trickle in, that the Holy Spirit starts moving in our life. And it's okay to do something like raise your hands. It's okay to clap out loud. It's okay to say amen. It's okay to do those things. God wants us to have a a present that flourishes, a present that means something, a present that is empowering to us. But we can't have it if we're not plugging into the right sources. And I have a tendency to plug into the wrong ones. What am I? I mindlessly scroll through Bleacher Report, which is a sports app. Mindlessly scroll through this. Like we just, we feel like we just want to rest, right? We want rest. So what do we do? We come in and we turn the TV on and we just zone out. But then we wake up the next morning and we're still tired and we're wondering why. Because we need a power that raises people from the dead, not one that just numbs our mind long enough to help us get to sleep at night. We have to start plugging into that. Number three, today, well, there's, I, yeah, number, mark down Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, and you can go back and read that one later. Maybe a verse that many of you are familiar with, but read it in context of that. Number three is this, my future can be secure. 
you know, only a fool would go through life unprepared for something that's inevitable. Death is inevitable. It comes for every single one of us. And only a fool goes through life unprepared for something they know is certain to happen. But no one wants to talk about it, right? Like, we don't invite our friends over and say, oh, so, uh, you know, instead of Cardinals baseball tonight, man, I thought we'd talk about death. <laughs> Woo! All right. <laughs> oh, man. You know what I mean? Like, we don't talk about it. But we've got to have, it's got to be something we talk about. Here's some things that kids have said about death. Gilda, age eight, said this. When you die, they put you in a box and bury you in the ground because you don't look too good. <laughs> right? <laughs> Stephanie, age nine, says, doctors help you so you won't die until you pay their bill. <laughs> oh, man, I laughed out loud at some of these. Marcia, age nine, this is fitting because some of our, our, our kids' teachers are here. When you die, you don't have to do homework in heaven unless your teacher's there, too. <laughs> Raymond, age 10, says this, a good doctor can help you see you won't die. A bad one sends you to heaven. <laughs> but you think about what, what we think about death, you know, and, and all this. And, and everybody's, guys, this deep internal, long, long, eternal, eternal longing to know, like, what's going to happen in the end? Like, what's after this life? It's obvious we're going to spend more time in eternity than we are on this earth. We spend, what, 60, 70, 80 90 years here, that's like preschool for eternity, right? Like that's this much and you have filled the room with the rest of time and that's eternity. It's the first inch of the yardstick. And so what does the Bible say? Well, one day you're going to stand before God and you're going to need to know the right answers. Hear what the Bible says about our future, that heaven is a perfect place. Now, I don't know what perfect means. There's a lot of imagery described in, in, in the Bible of what heaven looks like. You know, some of us are, are beach people, and, and so we think of heaven being like a beach. Some of us are mountain people, and so we think of heaven being a mountain. So that's not individual. Here's what the best we can describe from heaven. Heaven's going to have all of it. In fact, they, from what I have read and studied, heaven, as we think of it, you know, the place not earth, is like a holding part until the end when Jesus comes back, and we're going to have a new heavens and a new earth. So we're going to be able to enjoy all the things that you, wherever your favorite place at, middle of the woods, hunting, whatever. I think heaven is going to be earth perfected like it was in, gar in the Garden of Eden time before sin entered into the world. But it's going to be a perfect place of total love, peace, joy, perfection, no sin, no mistakes, no evil, no things that make us cry, no things that make our hearts hurt. Perfect in every way, a perfect place. But in order for you to get there, you have to be perfect because only the perfect get into heaven. I'm pretty sure that that would leave all of us out, right? Like if perfection were the, the way. See, the Bible kind of gives us two ways of getting to heaven. Now, we don't think of it this way, but I want you to bear with me for a minute. There's the perfection way. You make all the right decisions. You do all the right things. And not by our standards, but by God's. You make all the right decisions. You do all the right things. You make all the right choices. You don't do all the wrong things. You don't do all the bad things. Like you are perfect 100% of the time. Anybody? Like, so right now, by that, we're going, oh, oh, we're in trouble. So what's the other way? The other way isn't the perfection plan, it's the perfected plan. And the perfected plan is this, that, that you trust in Christ, that he knew we weren't going to be perfect, and so we say we believe in him when, we say, when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Well, Jesus said that. Well, who he says is who he, you know, he is who he says he is. So therefore, I must listen to this. I must say, okay, then he's the way, the truth, and the life. It means Jesus was the only perfect person who ever lived because he's God. And you know what? By trusting in him and having a relationship with him, guess what happens? This great, there's a theological term, but there's this great exchange that takes place. Jesus bore my sin on the cross so that whenever I place my faith and trust in him, his righteousness or his perfection gets put onto my account. So if we're thinking this in accounting terms, he takes the loss, I get the gain. And so when God looks at me, he sees Jesus, that I'm clothed in Christ's righteousness. That's why 
Jesus is so crucial to the Christian faith. That it's not about, it's not about a religion. It's not about, um, you know, about do's and don'ts. And, although that's an aspect of it because our response to him for his saving us is obedience. But it's not all there is. It's not just checking boxes. John 17, 3 tells this, and this is the way to have eternal life. Jesus prays this in the high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. This is the way to have eternal life. To know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one whom you sent to the earth. That's, that's the way to eternal life. This is, this is Jesus telling us in no uncertain terms, as if he hasn't already, because in John chapter 14, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Here he's telling us in the high priestly prayer, the only way to get there, the only way, is the one true God and Jesus Christ, the one who sent to earth. Here's the thing, though. We try a lot of different ways to get there. Here's a few of them. Sincerity. We, try, we say, well, I'm, I'm, well if, as long as you're sincere in your beliefs. And I, I made this illustration of the day. If I had a glass of chlorine or bleach, and I said, you know what? I sincerely believe this to be water. <laughs> what difference does it make if I'm wrong about the truth? Like that bleach or chlorine is still going to kill me. Right? So what you sincerely believe doesn't matter because you can sincerely be wrong, just like I would be about the bleach. And so it's not just sincerity. What's the other one? Well, there's service. I'm going to do stuff. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. I'll do all these good things, and I'll work my way there, but it doesn't work because you can't be good enough. There was only one who was good enough, and he died as our sacrifice. The third thing is subtraction. So you have sincerity, service. These are wrong ways. These are ways we try to get into heaven or at least make us feel better about how we're getting there. Subtraction. I also called it sacrifice. I'm going to get rid of the bad stuff. Like I'm just going to get rid of stuff. And so I'm trying to subtract or sacrifice things from my life. We give up a bunch of things and then I'll get to heaven. I'm going to give up all this bad stuff. And, And here's the deal. You can't make enough sacrifices. There was one who made the ultimate sacrifice, and that's the one that we place our hope in. The next one, ritual, right? This is the, well, I'll go get baptized, or I'll, I'll go to church, or I'll do this, or I'll do that. Like there's some sort of routine or tradition that we, we tend to think of. And, 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 but that's not what God says gets us into his kingdom. It's a relationship, not ritual. Matter of fact, he had a whole lot of followers who thought they were on the right path by doing their rituals. And he says, listen, you're, you're giving me all these offerings. We said, I don't want that. Like, I want your hearts. Like, I want you, not just you following a list of, of rules. Now, what's the next one? Um, heritage. This is the one that says I'm saved because my daddy was saved, or my mama was saved, or my granddaddy was saved, or my daddy was, or my grandpa was a preacher, or my great grandpa pastored this church, or whatever case may be. And we think we get in riding on their coattails. Let me ask this question I'm not married today because somebody deep in my heritage was married too. Like their marriage did not mean that I automatically am married. I had to make that choice. I had to find that spout. Like I, that is what, like I'm married because I chose that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with Ashley. I choose that. I choose it every day. But here's the thing. Most of us have a tendency to think like that's in our spiritual lives. But here's the deal. You have to make the choice. Your faith has to be your own. Doesn't matter what your mom and dad did. It's great that they did that. We celebrate that. But what have you done? Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Have you made that decision to follow him? Do you have that relationship with him? Because that's what's important. And the last one is is, is comparison. Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Or, or, you know, I'm better than this person. But God doesn't compare us to anybody else on this earth. He's not going to get us up there. He's not going to put like me on one side of the scale and somebody else on the other side and our sin, you know, well, you know, my sins outweigh the sins of, of, of Bob. So Bob's going to get in and sorry, Andy, in this comparison, you lose. The, the scales are not in your favor. Boink, and I'm gone, right? It's not how that works. So, how, what, so what happens? Like we put our hope in these things. Like that's what we base all this. And when that starts getting pulled away, we go, oh, but, but, but what, what happens Jesus doesn't leave us there. In our, in our, in, 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 he gives us hope. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. 
He uses that language with, uh, Jesus uses it with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He has caused us to be born again to a what? A living hope. That's a hope for today. That's for right now. That's the hope I can have right now in this moment. To a living hope through what? My heritage, my sacrifices, my subtractions, my sincerity. No, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. From the dead. That's why the resurrection matters. And that's why it matters for you. It's not a fairy tale, well, it sounds really good. I'm telling you, you talk to anybody in this church and we'll tell you, you cannot convince us otherwise that Jesus is who he says he is. That he has the power he says he has. That, his, that he makes his promises and he keeps his promises. In fact, next week, we're going to begin a new series through the month of May called Always True. And we're going to look at five promises that God gives us in his word. But this matters to us. Why? Because when we start putting this together, it means our sins can be forgiven. Our future can flourish, our, our present can flourish, and our, our, and our future is secure. I want to ask you this morning, what are you placing your hope in? See, some of us came in and we say Jesus, but really what we're looking at is we're looking at sincerity. We're looking at service. We're thinking subtraction. I've made these sacrifices. I'm, I come to church every week. I'm, I, you know, my family uh, is, has been lifelong members of this church. You know, I'm comparing myself to other people. But all those le- are lacking in some way. The only hope we genuinely and truly have in this life and in the next is Jesus Christ. And so as you stand, and we're going to have our musicians come forward this morning, where are you placing your hope at today? Where are you placing your hope? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you today. God, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, it is in your word that you have kind of warned us of the pitfalls that that we can have a tendency to fall into. The things like, you know, just the sincerity angle and the, and the subtraction angle and, the, and the, all those different angles, Lord. And time and time again, Lord, you come back to us, Lord. You were revealed to us that it's about having a relationship with you. God, a relationship involves communication. It involves being intentional with how we spend our time. It, it involves choosing each day to wake up and set our eyes on the things that matter most. It, it, a relationship involves, excuse me, prioritizing. And God, I pray that you would help us to maybe see today the true nature of our relationship with you. God, some of us are claiming a relationship in word only, but what our life really looks like is more of the things that lead us to a wide way that ultimately leads to destruction. We're looking for the, the comparison, or we're looking for the ritual, or we're looking for something to just help us at least convince ourselves that we're okay. And God, we don't need to be convinced today. What we need is to be convicted. And God, what we need to be is to, what we need to do is turn our hearts to you that we can have assurance. That God, we can know for a fact this morning that we are your child. That we can know for a fact today that our sins have been forgiven. God, that we can know for a fact today that our future, our present can flourish, and God, that our future is secure. God, I pray right now that as your Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts, God, God, I pray that, that, that there would be a degree of, of clarity, a degree of certainty, God, you are not a God of confusion, but of power and of love and of self-control. So God, I pray now for clarity in hearts and in minds, Lord, I pray for courage, in lives, Lord, that we would respond in the way that you're calling us to respond. For it is in your name and for your glory, God, we ask all these things. Amen. So with this song of invitation, I know things are a little tied up front, but we got a stage here where there's some steps.